Next Sunday, Saturday evening, what do you do? You spring forward, so that means you're going to lose an hour's sleep next Sunday. So for some of you, it shouldn't be a problem. You'll just catch up in church, okay? <laughs> but anyway, don't forget to do that when you go to bed next Saturday evening. Move them forward. We'll do our best to send out a reminder email, all right, on Friday, reminding you to do that on Saturday. But uh, we thought we would just uh, get you thinking about that now. Well, good morning. It is great to see you out. Uh, let me draw your attention to the screen in our morning announcements. This evening is our Sunday evening service. It's at 5 p.m. and it's a family-style service. You can worship together as a family, take communion together, and tonight there'll be a message about loving your enemies. And we'll be using St. Patrick as an example. We hope to see you tonight, 5 p.m. It's that time again, and it's men's breakfast on March 9th. Coffee is ready at 7.30, and then we'll eat at 8 o'clock, and this month, we'll be hearing from Doug Cockrell. He runs the Abundant Life Ranch out in Sanger. This is a horse ministry, and it has been a positive effect on so many lives. Come and hear about his and his wife's ministry, and eat a great breakfast. See you then. Hello, seniors. You're going to want to save the date on your calendars for Tuesday, March 12th. That's our senior lunch, and we'll be celebrating St. Patrick's Day. It'll be a potluck lunch starting at 12 p.m. Sign-up sheets are coming around this morning, so make sure you sign up, and we'll see you there. Join us for a church-wide meeting today at 1230 in the Sanctuary. Hope to see you all there. All right. Uh, since Cecil let off talking about the commercial, <laughs> just an opportunity to catch you up on the things that are going to be happening. Let me get the sign-ups going around right away. This is for Senior Luncheon, which will be a week from this Tuesday. If you are going to be attending Senior Luncheon, they would love for you to indicate on here that you're coming. And number two, what it is you'll be bringing for the potluck. You can bring a main dish. You can bring a side dish. You can bring a dessert. Hi, Cecil. How are you today? Good, 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 good. See, turn, turn and face the audience. See, he's smiling. He's smiling. All right. They would like for you to indicate uh, what you're bringing, main dish, side dish, or dessert. You can bring more than one if you would like, but please indicate what it is you're bringing because if we have any uh, vacancies, we have any gaps, they would like to take care of that, all right? So you put your name, put down, here's an example, name of dish, chicken, and you check main dish, all right? If you're bringing a salad, all right, then write down salad and it would go under a side dish, all right? Green beans, side dish. So are we clear? All right. So you qualify if you're 55 or over, okay? Some of you, this would be your very first one, all right? So come join us, all right? So the sign-up sheets for that are going around. This next Saturday is also our men's breakfast that Mark mentioned a moment ago. Love to have you here at 8 o'clock, men. Great way to meet other guys, and uh, you're going to enjoy the program this coming Saturday. Um, I was going to, uh, I didn't know if Cecil was going to be here today or not because I hadn't seen him yet, but let me tell you, he sent me a text last night. Here's the text that he sent me. Thank you, exclamation point. I am so blessed to have this opportunity to serve the church. I come away every time being lifted up. Praise God. Sounds like a man who enjoys his ministry. All right? So we are so excited to have Cecil on our staff as our visitation pastor. All right? Uh, I, I was handed a thank you uh, from Fred, all right, with Prison Fellowship. Thanks for the bike donations that several of you provided, all right? Uh, he took over 45 bikes to prison, all right, to be refurbished, and then they will be reused. And uh, that, that prison ministry has given out over 400 bikes to kids, all right? And so they have 45 new ones to work on. So thank you. 
If you miss the opportunity to get rid of a bike out of your garage, just hold on to it a few more months. They'll do it again in the summer, all right? And provide those bikes to the inmates at a prison here in the valley. Those inmates completely refurbish those bikes. They look like they're brand new, and then they give them to kids who otherwise would not be able to have a bike. So we're excited about that. Uh, church tonight, all right, 5 o'clock. I know it's going to be a busy day. We have three services, then we have a business meeting right after our last service, and then 5 o'clock evening service. Uh, There'll be communion tonight. Mark will be preaching about loving your enemies, and he's tying in some stories out of the life of St. Patrick, all right? So since this is March and it's the day you celebrate St. Patrick's Day, I can't wait to hear his message this evening. So hope you'll come and join us for those things. Uh, Please take note of some important dates. The pie auction coming up March the 24th. I'll talk a lot more about that next week. We have a church cleanup day on Saturday, March the 30th, uh, before Easter month and April, and then the ladies, you have a retreat that first weekend of April. I understand the ladies had their first walk fest yesterday, all right? Group of ladies show up to go for a walk. I understand you planned a two-mile walk that turned into a four-mile walk. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and it did not rain, so that was wonderful during their walk, okay? So that is terrific. Um, let me briefly just talk about the, uh, the meeting after the last service today. It's a brief business meeting, probably a half an hour. We're going to be doing three things. Uh, one, we have some elder board recommendations. There are three of our members who have fulfilled their three-year obligation, and they are willing to go back on again. So we'll be recommending those three back to you. And we also have two brand new names to recommend to you for our, our, our leadership board here. And uh, that is from our 8 o'clock service, Brent Sarabian, and then also from usually the 915 service, but he's coming in the late service today, and that is Doug Cecil. And so those candidates will be on there, and you either say yes or no, okay? So it's pretty easy. It's, it's, it's not the best three or the top three. It's yes or no on all five of them, okay? So uh, after that, we're going to be talking about the barn, where we are in our pledges. As you know, last year in September, we launched our pledge drive, and we received $1.2 million in pledges, okay, for our building that we hope will start July the 1st with uh, breaking of the ground here. Um, From the pledges, we have already received right at $500,000 of those $1.2 million in pledges that has come in since October, which I think is really, really good. In less than five months, all right, a half a million dollars has been received. So we are very, very grateful for that. So thank you. Uh, Those of you who are making monthly commitments, they are coming in uh, the last two months at about $15,000 a month. Now we have some who are doing larger donations once a year, and we have others who are doing it on a quarterly basis. But whatever your commitment was, thank you so much. And we'll be talking more about reaching our goal of 1.5 to 1.6, probably after Easter, all right? But those of you who've already made those commitments, thank you so much. They're coming in and we appreciate that. Then the last thing we'll do is uh, we will distribute the 2018 financial end of the year statement. It's very similar to what you saw the 1st of December as we shared with you the budget for 2019. We do have the uh, last month's finances there. Uh, At any time, any of you, whether you are a member of this church or a regular attender or brand new to the church and you want to know how do we spend our money, you can go to our website and you can go under resources and you will find church financials for 2018 and you can click on it. And there you will find not only the budget compared to our actual expenses for the year. You will also find the balance sheet, and you will also find uh, the building fund breakdown. All right, so it is all there. What will be distributed today is the budget compared to the expenses, because that's what most folks look at, all right? And uh, that's what we've discovered over the years, about 98.9% of the people want to read. But for those of you who have accounting backgrounds, Mr. Price, all right, the other things are online for you, so you're, you're welcome to go. And at any time, not just at the beginning of a year, the beginning of a year, uh, our monthly financials each month are put up. All right, after they've been approved by our finance team, uh, you can always go to the website and look at them. And if you have any questions, you can call Mark. 
our associate pastor, who was also our church treasurer. You could call Shelly, who is our financial officer. Uh, you can call me, and I will ask Barker Shelly, whatever it is that you are asking, okay? So, uh, but we, we have no problem ever. If you ever have any questions, do not hesitate to call. We're happy to explain anything to you, all right? Uh, we're going to take, just before we engage in worship, uh, we have a special presentation to make this morning. So I'm going to ask Eric Olson if he will come forward, please. Eric Olson. Obviously, Eric, you have a calling, I mean, a following here because they applauded just at the mention of your name. They have no idea why I'm bringing you up here today, and they just applauded. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, many of you do know, though, a week ago, this last Thursday night, we had a big celebration here at the church. Every Thursday night, uh, Celebrate Recovery meets here. It's for folks who have hurts, habits, or hang-ups. And quite frankly, more of you probably ought to attend. But... Um, uh, that ministry has been going on here at New Hope for 10 years, and Eric has been the sole leader of that group, all right? Uh, he was part of the original Celebrate Recovery that was brought to Fresno at Northwest, uh, and, and he kept telling us about it here, and finally the day came where we needed to do one here. And so we had the privilege uh, Thursday night a week ago to present him with this plaque, all right? Let me tell you what the plaque says. It says, Celebrate Recovery, here, here. Now, so they understand what the here, here means. Would you tell them how you end every Celebrate Recovery meeting? So one of the last things we do on Thursday nights is put something on the board that says uh, what you, who you see here, what you hear here, let it stay here. When here, you here. Here, here. Here, here, here. So that's where the here, here comes from. All right. So celebrate recovery. Here, here. Celebrating 10 years of ministry. Eric Olson, for your tireless service, your infectious enthusiasm, your boundless love, and for lighting and fanning the flame of faith for so many. From your second family at New Hope Community Church, February 2019. So we wanted to present that to him in front of all of you. And you may be seated. Uh, over the last few months, uh, Eric and I have engaged in uh, uh, numerous conversations uh, about Celebrate Recovery and this 10th anniversary. At the same time, uh, Eric was sharing that God was putting in his heart to do some other things in ministry. Uh, in the community around New Hope Church. Celebrate Recovery requires a lot of time. Some of you may not know he works for Caltrans. He's, a civil, uh, he's an engineer. Do work. He does work, yes. <laughs> he's not one of those who leans on the shovel, all right? He actually does the work. And so he's an engineer with them, and he's taken on new responsibilities that require a lot more of his time. And, and so anyway, uh, not wanting to take away from the 10th anniversary celebration, we have waited until this week to share with you that Eric uh, has chosen to step down from Celebrate Recovery leadership. He's not leaving us. He's not running away, but he's looking for what God has next in his life. And so um, we look at these last 10 years with great joy. It's wonderful when you have somebody leading a ministry that you have absolute confidence in. And I've never had a worry about the ethics or uh, uh, what transpired under his leadership and his ministry. And I've been so blessed to have him there. And so, uh, but just as God provided Eric for the past 10 years, God has somebody to lead us into the next 10 years. And so no decision has been made. Eric will continue to serve in this capacity through the end of this month. And uh, we will be taking applications and people's interests who would like to possibly uh, engage in this leadership. Eric will be available to provide uh, training as well as others. And so uh, we simply want to share with you that uh, Eric will be stepping down from this area of leadership. And we are so grateful for the years that he's given to us. And he has a few words he would like to share. You know, Tim said under my soul leadership, and that's not accurate. Uh, <laughs> Celebrate Recovery is a group ministry, and, and I, I want to say thank you to so many of you, uh, to the church as a whole, for uh, supporting the ministry, and then just so many of you have, over the years, uh, either participated in the ministry and, and 
been leaders within the ministry or uh, provided meals or child care or so many things that, that are needed to, to make the ministry happen every Thursday night. So um, I'm grateful. I, I appreciate the plaque. I, I shared this morning that it's another, uh, we have a cabinet in our living room where we have a bunch of knick-knack stuff and I, and I set that on top. I've had it for about a week and every morning when I'm, when I'm reading, I can, I can look up at it and just, you know, realize what, what God's done in my own life. And that's the number one thing in the ministry that is sharing what God's done in our lives. One of my favorite scriptures is uh, the blind man that Jesus said, go and tell what's happened to you. And the Pharisees tried to corner him and said, what did he say about himself? All I know is I was blind and now I see. <laughs> so, I mean, everyone of us has a testimony of what God's done in our life. And uh, I, I can look up at that plaque every morning and, and just be thankful that he, he took my life uh, out of control, alcoholic, drug addict. And, and just transform it the way he has. So I'm, I'm thankful, number one, to him, but thankful to, to all of you for, for giving the opportunity to Amen. 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 God bless you, buddy. I love you. Yeah. So I've, I've given this to him uh, three times now, and I've taken it back three times. All right. So I get to do it once more. Yeah, I remember the first time that Eric showed up here. Uh, uh, he was recently clean and sober, very recently. And he was skinny, really skinny. And he was single. Uh, he was fathering two daughters, all right, that he didn't father, but he accepted that role and responsibility from a previous relationship in his wild and crazy days, and he has fulfilled those responsibilities. He's married him a wonderful wife, and he's gone on to be an engineer with, with uh, Caltrans, and uh, we see the difference that God makes, and there's a reason the name of the ministry is Celebrate Recovery. Because when you recover from the damage that you've done and the damage that these decisions have done in your life and you turn them over to Christ, there is recovery. And we love to celebrate that. So amen. With that, we ought to worship the Lord, all right? So I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and offering and uh, our worship team. And I, don't, I think we have special music today. Is that right? Yeah. All right. So... Anyway, we'll engage in all of that uh, now that we have taken care of our announcements. Would you join with me as we pray? There are a couple of prayer requests I want to highlight that are not in your bulletin. It's great to see Kent with us today. Wave, Kent. All right. He's breathing pretty good today. All right. If he starts coughing, don't worry about it. He's not contagious. And he is going to go to the foyer. You already told me. All right. Uh, but it's good to see him. But we want to continue to pray for Kent. But we also want to pray for his mama. She's at St. Agnes Hospital. She has sepsis. And so uh, she's in some challenging straits today. My, uh, my cousin Shelly's husband, David, that I mentioned last week, it has been confirmed. His cancer is back. He's going to be starting treatment. He's going to be making a trip to Stanford, all right? And so please be remembering to pray for David as he starts this up. Uh, Dan had a treatment this week, all right? And so he's kind of flat on his back right now. So be, be remembering uh, him. Tom Howe from our church has been uh, in the hospital for over a week. So please be remembering to pray for these folks. Would you join with me as we thank God for his availability to our lives? Father, for this day and what it is that you have as desires and purposes for our lives, may you find each of us willing and ready and responsive to what your leadership is. Father, um, the desire of your heart is that we, every moment of every day, would live in dependence upon you. We would not make any decision, big or small. We wouldn't plan um, any direction in our life, big or small. We wouldn't have any other purpose in our life but what it is that you want to do in and through us. You want to be the source of your own demands. You want to be the dynamic of every powerful thing that takes place in our lives. And I hope that we will let you. It's hard to do that all at once, but I trust in growing measure we give you more and more of our lives, more and more of our circumstances, more and more of our decisions. I hope we learn that it's better to surrender to you in advance than it is after the fact. And so, Lord, I hope that we'll learn and grow in those areas. We trust you with the needs that we have expressed here today. 
Lord, for Kent and for Kent's mom, we trust you with their needs. For David and Dan as they're going through their treatment. For Irma, it's great to see her today and how well treatment uh, has worked in her life at this moment. Lord, we trust you with others who've been in the hospital like Dalton and Marge Tharp and how they're recovering now, and we thank you for that. Lord, for those unknown needs that are present and some unmentioned needs today, Lord. Uh, the fact that they may be unknown to us or unmentioned in our presence doesn't mean you are neglectful of them at all. You know each and every concern that we have here today. And you are attentive to those things. And Father, if there's ways that you want to use any of us to be your hands, your feet, your voice of help, hope, or encouragement, may you find us ready and willing and quick to respond to your leadership in those areas. Lord, we, we as a church are so grateful for your sufficiency in meeting the needs of this church financially. Just not only our operations of day-to-day -day expenses, but Father, for the outreach into the community and the outreach to other churches and the outreach to other ministries that make a difference to our missions programs outside the, 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 the reach of the United States. We are so grateful that you have provided through this people in abundance. And we say thank you today. And Father, that should never inhibit our giving because there's an abundance. But Father, it should encourage our giving because there is more and more that you would love to do in and through us as we give and as we even think about giving sacrificially. We trust you for this and so much more. In Jesus' name, amen. Last night uh, is the 10th Hoover High Baseball Hall of Fame dinner and fundraiser that I've had the privilege of going to. Uh, I did not play baseball. Wished I would have, but I didn't. But um, I knew the coach very, very well, and we've had some men from our church who've been recognized and are members as uh, part of the Hall of Fame for Hoover High School back in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s. And um, Jack Hanna, and Hal Froze were the two legendary coaches for over 25 years at Hoover High School. Many of you know Jack Hanna, uh, sons of the San Joaquin. Uh, but I listened to Jack share last night as he made some comments that it was never his desire to have a group called Sons of the San Joaquin. Even when they got heard at a small event and a pretty high-brow country western singer said, I can take you guys to Nashville and you won't have to work your way up. And they didn't. And for over 25 years, Sons of the San Joaquin, I mean, they, they sang for the Queen of England. They opened up lots of huge, big shows. And Jack said, none of that was important to me. He said, what I knew my purpose in life was, was to be light that could shine into the dark hearts of young men on a baseball field. And then he introduced a baseball player from the 1960s. Jim Bourne remembers him. Jim Bourne played with him. Is it Rick Fuller? I'd never met Rick until last night, briefly got acquainted with him. Rick Fuller was the first Hoover High athlete to be drafted into professional baseball. I believe he was drafted by the Philadelphia Phillies, if, if I remember what they said last night. He played two years in the organization. It came to an end because of an injury. And then he went in the Navy and became a medic to the Marines during Vietnam. He married his high school sweetheart. He went on to become the chief of police for Dixon, California. Worked there for 35 years. When he was introduced and he had a chance to speak, he thanked Jack for molding him into a better baseball player. He thanked Jack for the influence that he had had in his life to make him take the step from high school to professional baseball. But then he said the most important thing. He said, Jack, what I want to thank you most for is you showed me faith, you told me about faith, and I am a Christian today because of what you did for me. 
May we have more coaches throughout this valley that would leave that kind of legacy. But that was a perfect segue. Wished I would have thought about it in the 8 o'clock service, but that's a perfect segue into today's sermon. Is to hear a coach brag about his Savior and to hear an athlete brag about his coach who told him about his Savior. That is really what this series of sermons has been all about since the beginning of January. Is you and I being intentional about our faith with family, friends, neighbors, and as God provides opportunity, even strangers. It's not about going out and buttonholing people and and giving them a sales pitch. It is about living the life that all of us are called to as believers in Jesus Christ so that others will ask of us, why do you have such a hope-filled life in such a discouraging, troubled world? I invite you in advance to turn to Gospel of John. In a few minutes, we'll be reading some verses out of chapter 1. Last week, I gave you an assignment, and I will fulfill half of that assignment today. We will not get to the book of Acts. (laughs) We will only be in the Gospel of John today. So, John chapter 1. Do you remember what the title of last Sunday's sermon was? This is always dangerous for preachers because nobody ever remembers. What was that, Jenny? Who said that? Oh, oh, Bob. That a boy. Boy, you sound like Chin for a moment, all right? You are known by what you brag about. So who you been bragging about lately? Some of you will recognize the name Malcolm Muggridge. Actually, just out of curiosity, how many of you recognize the name Malcolm Muggridge? Raise your hand. Okay, about four of you, okay? Uh, <laughs> he's dead now, all right? Uh, he, he, was, he was 40 at World War II, okay? So he's an old guy. He's even older than dad, okay? And um, Malcolm Muggridge was kind of big when I was in the 70s, and the reason is he was uh, atheist, agnostic, Well, he was a a man who was raised in church, became an agnostic, then an atheist, uh, then a socialist, and then a Christian, (laughs) okay? It was a very serendipitous route to his faith, all right? And he was an outstanding writer, all right? He was a journalist and an author. And so let me tell you a little bit of Malcolm Muggridge's story this morning. He wrote a book, it was his memoirs, entitled The Chronicles of Wasted Time, Malcolm Muggridge tells of events that took place in Africa in 1943. He was 40 years old, but his experience of four decades of life had been filled with progressive disillusionment. After Cambridge education, he spent three years in India, which shattered his religious beliefs. Two years in Stalin's Russia, it left his idealistic materialism in ruins. Even World War II only led to further disillusionment. He tried to enlist in the military, but he was turned down because of health concerns. He then was accepted as a spy in the British Secret Service. He was a James Bond. But he found that being stuck in Lorenco Marquis, monitoring the German disruption of Allied shipping, was far from glamorous. As a result... He wrote, much of the time, I wish I was dead. To cut a long story, very, very short, one night in absolute despair, Muggridge decided to end his life. He drove six miles out of town. He undressed, folded and left his clothes on the beach, and he waded out into the dark, cold waters, and he started swimming away from shore. Quickly, he was out of sight of the beach, and he could only see the twinkling of distant lights. All of a sudden, he says, I began to tremble. And then without any conscious thought or decision making, I turned around and started swimming towards shore. My eyes fixed on the glow from Peter's Cafe and the Costa de Sol He says about that moment, those were the lights of the world. Those were the lights of my home. Those were my habitat. It's where I belonged. 
And all I could think is, I must reach them. And after I got to shore, there was an overwhelming joy such as I've never, ever experienced before. It was ecstasy. Was this Malcolm's conversion moment? He says, no, it was not. But it was the simple beginning of a long quest to understand the glimmer of light that he had sensed in the midst of despair and which seemed to be represented by those lights on shore. On that momentous occasion, he had been given strength and resolve to begin a long journey back to God. And it began with the glimmer of light. Let's read John chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Let me pause. John the disciple is the one who wrote the gospel of John. John, the brother of James, the two brothers were the sons of Zebedee. He is the gospel writer, the same one who wrote the book of Revelation. As I read to you this verse, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He's not talking about himself. We make that very clear. John's not talking about himself, but John, the gospel writer, the disciple of Jesus, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, is talking about John the Baptist. Okay, so let me make that clear so we know exactly who we're talking about here. So John the disciple says about John the Baptist, there was a man sent from God. And if we had the time, we would turn back to the gospel of Luke and we read the story about the birth of John the Baptist. It was miraculous, all right? Handpicked, specially chosen from his birth to be John the Baptist. But we're going to keep going right here. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into this world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him, and he came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him. To them, the one who is the light gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, those who were born not of blood. It's not where you were born or to whom you're born to. It is not of the will of the flesh. It is not by hard works and good deeds. Nor is it of a good, strong will that any person might have, but you have been born of God. And the word, capital W, referring to the light, capital L, he became flesh, and he dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father who was full of grace and truth. And John, that is John the Baptist, bore witness of him, and he cried out, saying, this is he of whom I've said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but I'm going to read a few verses from Genesis chapter 1. It seems like it's really hard to read John chapter 1 without going back to Genesis chapter 1. There are some great similarities. In the beginning was the Word, John chapter 1 verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God. Okay, that's actually where baseball got started. In the big inning, okay, the big <laughs> inning, all right? So we know baseball's been around for a long, long time, all right? But let me refer back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. 
And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. He didn't call it good. He called it night. He called the light good. And all he did was make an observation about the darkness. And he split them. So God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide waters from waters, the sky from, 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 from what was on this globe. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And so the evening and the morning were the second day. And then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw what? That it was good. And then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and the herb that yields seeds according to its kind and the tree that yields fruits whose seed is in itself. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the first day. And then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, in the sphere above the earth, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And then God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. I, I want, you, you probably have already figured this out, but I want, I want to make sure something's really clear in your minds. The sun and the moon and the stars don't show up until which day? Day four. But there was light and darkness. Okay? Where'd the light come from? I suggest to you, this is the same principle that functions in heaven. For if you remember what we talked about when we talked about heaven last year, there is no need, the scripture says, for the sun and the moon in heaven, for the source of light in heaven is who? God the Son. He is the one who shines brightly and lights up. There is, the Bible says there is no night there. So heaven is perpetual daylight. Hell is perpetual darkness because there's no light there. And so what we have in the beginning of time is the light that illuminated this world before man was ever created. It's the light of God himself. And just so you know, God knows a little something about science and physics. He knows just a little. Okay? And so he knew that in order for there to be days and nights and seasons of the year, there needed to be scientifically a sun and a moon. And there needed to be this 24-hour period that would function and those 24-hour days would roll into seasons. And so we have the understanding now of how all this took place. And is it shocking or surprising that it fits the formula of science? What I would suggest to you, that good science fits creation, fits God. We learn in these verses that the holy creator made the stars and the planets. He strategically placed the moon near the dwelling place that he created for those in his image on the earth. The stars were placed, as we read in verse 14, as signs. Although we look up at night and we see the moon shine, let me clarify, we are seeing the moon shine. Okay? I want to make sure you know what moonshine I'm talking about right now. All right? <laughs> Not the kind you drink, but the kind you observe. All right? And in reality, we, most of us know this, all right, from our classes. In reality, the moon is not shining its own light. The moon is reflecting the light of the sun. The moon shines because its surface reflects the light from the sun. And despite the fact that it sometimes seems to shine very brightly, 
the moon reflects only 3 to 12% of the sunlight that hits it. The perceived brightness of the moon from Earth depends on where the moon is in its orbit on the planet. Now, just a side note, don't want to get too distracted here. You see the principle at work here? Sun, moon, moon reflecting. John the Baptist, he's not the light, but he's come to talk about the light. You and I are reflections of the light from the sun. You and I actually should start mooning people. <laughs> That's what we should do, okay? We should, we should allow the reflection of the sun to, and, and, and notice the moon reflects 3 to 12% placed upon where it is. I would say the amount of the sun that is seen in us is going to be dependent upon our position to the sun. Doesn't God do things really cool? A, f a, f a, a, a principle of science also has a spiritual principle in us. There was a well-known Bible teacher. Is anybody else hot in here? Okay, let's make sure the heaters are off and maybe who's the coldest person in the building? Raise your hand. Okay, would you turn this side cool on to about 72? Turn it to cool. Just, yeah, that one right there. Perfect. All right. No, don't worry about that side because the cold people are on that side. Okay? So we'll, we'll, and we'll see. If it gets cold, wave at me. All right? A well-known Bible teacher had just finished speaking to, at a large seminar of business professionals on the Christian's responsibility to be the light of the world and the workplace. He had emphasized that as believers, we all have the responsibility to reflect the light in the world. After the class, one of the members related to him an experience that he'd had in his own home that impressed this same truth in his life. He said that in the darkest corner of the basement in his house, he had made a surprising discovery. Some potatoes from a potato bag had rolled out of the bag into the darkest corner of the basement, and they had sprouted and were growing. I couldn't figure out how they could grow because it takes sunlight for potatoes to grow. How could they do that? Then I noticed that hung from the ceiling near the basement window was a shiny copper kettle that was brightly polished and it was in the perfect position for several hours in the middle of the day to reflect the sun's rays into that darkest corner of the room where those few potatoes had fallen. The person relating the story said, when I saw that, I thought, I might not be a preacher or a teacher with the ability to expound the scriptures, but at least I can be a copper kettle catching the rays of the sun, S-O-N, and reflect his light to someone else. I do not want anybody to look up. Okay? You never hear preachers say that. Okay, don't look up. We always should look up, but don't do that right now. I wonder how many of you could take paper and pen in hand and describe for me exactly what the lights in the sanctuary look like. I doubt most of you wouldn't have a clue. Okay, a few of us would because we've changed the bulbs. Okay, but most of the time, Husbands, if I were to ask you to describe the two lamps in your living room, could you really give me all the details of those lamps? I doubt it. You just know when you flip the switch, you want the light to come on. You see, there's a good reason for that. Lamps, when discharging their responsibility, are basically anonymous. Lamps behave incognito. They do their job... But we don't usually study a lamp. We simply enjoy the light. Isn't that the way it normally works? We enjoy the light. And that's our role as Christians. If we have claimed redemption through the shed blood of our once crucified and now risen Lord, if on the grounds of that redemptive transaction that Christ died for me so he now can come live in me and reflect his life through me, if he's taken up residence in our humanity to be his witness our privilege and responsibility is to be amongst those who discharge that privilege and responsibility in such a way that nobody is inclined to look at us. They simply enjoy the light. 
I think that's what Peter meant when he said, be ready to give every man an answer for the hope that lives within you. They don't see you, but they see your hope in the midst of trouble. See, that's the privilege of being a witness. No one notices the lamp. Do you know when we notice the lamp? When something goes wrong with the lamp. When it begins to flicker, when it goes out completely, when it might shine too brightly in our eyes, nobody notices the lamp under normal circumstances. It's simply when something goes wrong do we notice the lamp. So what's the lesson there? <laughs> Don't do anything wrong. Okay? Don't get in the way of the light, okay? We read verse 6 of John 1, a man sent from God, John. He was not the light, but he was sent to reflect, bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe. John was not the light, but he was there to be a witness to the light that all might enjoy the light. They weren't to go away and say, who wasn't John awesome? John said, that's not what's supposed to happen. He was not the light, but he was a witness to the light. John wanted to be unconscious about himself and enjoy the light. He talked about it being his supreme delight to bow himself out and push the Lord in their directions. He wanted to do it in such a way that folks would forget about the one who bore the testimony, but they would simply have a life-transforming encounter with the one of whom he testified. Remember, it is this same John the Baptist who said after the baptism of Jesus, I must decrease, so Jesus must increase. The marvelous thing about John as a witness was that his testimony was bearing testimony long after he was already dead. The influence of John the Baptist continued for months and years after he had lost his head. If you know that part of New Testament history, John the Baptist died a very cruel but sudden death because he was the light exposing the darkness and he wasn't afraid to do it anywhere, even to King Herod. And King Herod had adulterous and incestuous relationships. And John the Baptist let his light shine into the darkness of King Herod's own behavior and he called him to repent receive forgiveness and become a child of God. And Herod and his co-conspirators in sin hated John the Baptist and they cut his head off. Yet John still spoke. Most folks can't say much when they lose their head, but John the Baptist did. Though dead, he speaks. Do you remember anybody else that the Bible said that about? If you were at, um, um, if you were at, uh, yeah, good old what's his name's memorial service, good old Frank Hicks. If you were at Frank Hicks memorial service, you should remember. The verse we used to honor Frank was a passage out of Hebrews 11, verse 5. And Abel, though dead, yet speaketh. The testimony of the life of Abel though he was killed abruptly by his brother Cain. The life of Abel and the testimony of giving the right sacrifice still speaks generations later. The message of John bearing witness of the light, confessing that he was not the light, but bearing witness to the one who was the light that continued to speak to others as time went on. If we turn to John chapter 10, verse 40, we would find these words, John did no miracles. John did nothing sensational to draw attention to the message. He didn't have to do miracles, but all that John said about Jesus was true, and many believed on Christ. You see, we don't have to do spectacular things. We just need to tell the truth about the light in our own life. Everything John said rang true and was vindicated by Jesus' own life. And after John the Baptist was long dead, his testimony about Jesus rang true and it bore fruit because he bore witness to the light. In John chapter 1, around verse 19, now this was John's testimony. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, it's kind of like they sent reporters for a newspaper article. 
or a magazine. They, 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 they came to pepper John the Baptist with questions. They wanted to know who he was. He, all these people were flocking to hear his message, and he kept telling them about the light, the one who was Jesus. And when they wanted to know who he was, all that John the Baptist was prepared to tell them was who he was not. No, I am not Elijah. Are you a prophet? No, I am not a prophet. Finally, finally he says to them, if you must know who I am, I will tell you. And listen to his response. I am just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I am just a voice. They heard John speak and people followed. Not John, Jesus. If you look at verse 35, John chapter 1. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples, whose disciples were they at this moment? John's. When those two disciples who had been following John, when they heard John say, look, the Lamb of God, they followed Jesus. Have you ever heard of a preacher like that that says, go follow that guy, don't follow me? That's what all reflectors of light ought to be doing. Don't follow me, follow Jesus. When John looked around, He realized he had lost his congregation. John was preaching himself out of business. And that's what a light does. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came as a witness so that others might believe the light. He was very clear. I am not the light, but I bear witness to the light. Like John the Baptist, you and I are not the source of God's light. You and I are to be like the moon. We are to reflect the greater light. John was predestined to declare the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the true light. He lightens our path to God, and like a flashlight, he shines on the right path for us to follow. The word witness in this passage indicates our role as reflectors of that light. Like John, we need to point our family members, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers to the source of light who was no one else but Jesus Christ. It is said that he was in the world, Jesus, and the world was made through him, the creator, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. In just a very short paragraph, John shares some amazing truths. We learn that the world consists of everything that our creator God has created. In his second highlight, John speaks of the created world and those who don't believe. And then John speaks of unbelieving men and women living in a world of spiritual darkness, a world without God's influence. John teaches us that the world did not want to know him. This word know has multiple potential meanings. It comes from the root word gnosko. Some say it could mean they didn't recognize God or it could mean they did not personally respond to God. The word that's used here indicates the latter. They had heard, but they chose not to respond. And why didn't they? Could it be because they were blind? Or perhaps they were too busy? Or maybe it was because God would get in the way in which they wanted to live their own life. The Creator was rejected because they did not want His kind of world. In other words, they were not just blind. They were out and out guilty. They deliberately closed their eyes to the light of who Jesus is. He came to His own, and His own received Him not. Here now it is made clear that it's Jesus who John is talking about. Not just some abstract philosophical idea, but a human being who came as God's word and God's light, and they rejected him. Have you received or rejected him? It's a wonder to John that the very people who looked for the coming of Jesus, the Jewish nation who wanted a Messiah that had been prophesied about for over 800 years, A generation whose forefathers had waited longingly and yearningly for centuries for him to come. And now that he comes, they choose to reject him, willfully reject him. You see, what they wanted was superiority over other nations. 
They wanted to be rulers themselves. They wanted an abundance of good things. They wanted absolute protection in this world. Uh, They weren't concerned about the forgiveness of their sins. They weren't concerned about where they would go when they died. They were concerned about the here and now alone. But Jesus had come to reach the hearts of men and women, not to pander to our desires. He wanted them to yearn for truth, light, and life. Two of the verses, maybe the fifth or sixth verse that I learned in the Bible was verses 12 and 13 of John chapter 1. But as many as received him, who's the him? The him who was the light that John the Baptist reflected. To those who receive him, he gave the right, the privilege to become the children of God to those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood. You won't have a relationship with God because you're born into a Christian family. Nor of the will of the flesh, good works won't get it for you. Nor the will of any man or woman, stubbornness won't get you heaven. But when you've been born of God. We need to stop and take a moment and you need to reflect on these two verses personally. You may have been coming to New Hope for weeks, months, or years. You might think by hanging out at a place called New Hope that that's going to get you to heaven. It won't. The pastor can't take you on his coattails because they're too short. Your family breeding will not get you into heaven. The kindness and the patience that you may reflect in your daily life will not be good enough. There's one thing and one thing only. It's called grace upon grace. It is the free gift of God to any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, no matter what station in life they've ever had or experienced, who will all do the very same thing, and that is humble themselves before God and say, God, I am in darkness And I am drawn as Malcolm Muggeridge was to the lights on a seashore. I am drawn to the light of the resurrection. There are a few of you here who will remember Hank Williams Sr. Raise your hand if you remember. See, I'm not junior, senior. All right, some of y'all remember Hank Williams Jr. All right, this is the old man, senior. He wrote a song that actually the president of my Bible college loved to sing. Here's the words to the song that I think may be the best song Hank Williams Sr. ever wrote or sang. I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin, I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Just like a blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. Then like the blind man that God gave back his sight, praise the Lord, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. I was a fool to wander and stray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I've traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. So the question is twofold. Have you seen the light and accepted it into your own life? Don't postpone any longer. If you've sat in here today, you could not go in the presence of God and say, nobody ever told me. You've heard it today. So I will encourage you in just a moment as I close with a word of prayer. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer of receiving Jesus as your Savior. He'll forgive you of your sin. He'll come to live within you. And then you, when you die, will go to live with him. No fear, no worry. If you've never done that, I would encourage you to do it today. The secondary question is for the vast majority of you who have already prayed that prayer and you've been a Christian. Are you reflecting any? What percentage of the sun is shining off of your life? Sun, moon, positioning, reflection. Where is it? The moon only reflects no more than 12% of the brilliance of the sun. 
What percentage are we reflecting of the life of Christ in us? And what would we like for him to do? It might not be a John the Baptist, but we can all be a copper kettle. Let's pray. If you've never invited Christ in your life, why don't you pray a prayer like this? Father, I know now that your son, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. I know that he came to earth to give his life for me by pouring out his blood and dying in my place. He rose again on the third day, and he's back in heaven interceding for us. And God, thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. I ask you now to fill me with your light and your presence in the person of the Holy Spirit in my human spirit. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for coming to live within me. And thank you for taking me to live with you when I die. Thank you for being my everlasting life. From now on, I pray in the name of Jesus, who is my light, my life, and my Lord. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go have a good day and shine a little light.